Mr. Speaker, I am the proud daughter of the UAW. My family knew the power of being part of a union family. My dad, who came to the United States with only fourth grade education, felt human dignity for the first time when he worked at the Ford Mortar Company in Flat Rock on the assembly line and became a member of the UAW. We know this week hundreds and thousands of workers are fighting for a fair contract to support their families. And their current contract, Mr. Speaker, expires at midnight on September 14th. The right to strike in our country is the most single most powerful tool to fight corporate greed. In the first six months of this year alone, the big three, Ford's, Delantis, GM, made a combined $20 billion in profits. The big three CEOs received 40, a whopping 40% increase in pay, while workers right now, the majority of them, living check by check. Did you all know, and well, folks understand, since 1948, every single UAW contract had a cost of living adjustment, COLA. And in 2009, something spectacular happened. Workers came together and helped the big three stay afloat. So they decided to put COLA aside, allowing even the companies to create tier systems. And now in 2023, the, the contract doesn't have the cost of living adjustment. These are the same workers, Mr. Speaker, that sacrificed so much, and now the big three is refusing to have their back when they are struggling. Two workers doing the same job side by side should not be receiving drastically different wages and benefits due to tiers that were put in place during, during, the, during the Great Recession. Tier systems have no place on an assembly line. These companies should not be able to find loopholes to hire supplemental workers just to get away with paying them, get just so they can get away with paying them lower hourly wages and no retirement benefits. Mr. Speaker, my dad in the 1980s vested in health benefits and, and the benefits just within 90 days. There was no five, six, seven, eight, and I even met a young girl who said it took her dad 10 years to get on top of that tier. Folks don't realize the majority of the UAW workers in our country does not have a pension today. It's 2023. Auto workers should be able to retire with dignity. Every worker deserves guaranteed pension health care when they retire. The big three needs to value their own workers more than they value the profits in their own CEO pay increases. They need to do what's right. They have record profits and that should result in record contract. All right. My uh, name is Ben Burgess. This is Give Them an Argument. I am joined, as always, by our super producer, Jake Appett, and our very talented graphic designer, J. Andrew World. Uh, the uh, voice you just heard uh, was a congresswoman from my home state, uh, Michigan, uh, Rashida Tlaib, talking about the uh, unprecedented UAW strike against all of uh, of the big uh, the big three, and. Um, you know, it's funny, I was just thinking as we were watching that, that, you know, I, I know a lot of people in our world have a lot of opinions one way or the other about, you know, the uh, congresswomen who are sort of collectively referred to as, you know, the squad. And I think there are fair criticisms and there are dumb criticisms and, you know, whatever. Uh, I, I'm not ultimately that hung up on that. Um, you know, I've, if one of the things you're mad about them about is going along with the Railway Labor Act, which is a fair criticism, Rashida is actually the only one who didn't do that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I thought we were talking earlier about what to use as the cold open for today. And, um, you know, we were thinking about this, uh, this Mike Lindell thing to make fun of. That's the, my pillow guy and you know, whatever, we probably will do that in the post game, but, uh, I kind of wanted to, to go earnest on this and, uh, and do Rashida for the, the cold open for the main show, because, uh, cause I found that genuinely moving. So this is, you know, the, um, you know, I mean, this is something that, uh, certainly I was very aware of, uh, when I was, I was growing up, uh, that the, uh, that the UAW had, had made this massive difference in sort of delivering, um, this kind of stability and dignity to, uh, to, uh, a lot of people in, uh, in the, the sort of particular part of the world that I, I live in. And, you know, and, and I think right now under, you know, better leadership, they're trying to, uh, to claw some of that back and, uh, yeah, I don't know. Solidarity forever. I don't know what else to say about that. Yeah. Give them hell. Yeah. Sorry, sorry to the, uh, irony poisoned 
viewers that we may have that expect some kind of uh, humorous, <laughs> sarcastic video at the top. But, you know, sometimes you they, they need the medicine along with the sugar. I, I can never fucking remember. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We'll, we'll, we'll do medicine, you know. sugar. Yeah. Ben, yeah. we're going to pay money for that stuff this uh, this week. <laughs> yeah, exactly. You know, we're, we're not giving that out for free. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll give out the uh, we'll give out the uh, the metaphorical, uh, you know, medicine for free. Uh, but uh, the party drugs you got to pay for. But in any case. Um, all right. So there are a couple of things we want to hit uh, in the second half of the show. We've got uh, Chapo Trap House uh, host uh, Will Meneker. Uh, talking about the uh, GOP primary field and Thomas Friedman's latest uh, thoughts about Ukraine. Um, uh, that's a really fun conversation. We actually had to do that part as a pre-record, uh, so uh, which is why I know exactly uh, what we uh, what we cover. Uh, before that, uh, live uh, we have uh, Liza Featherstone, who is going to be talking about her uh, in these times article. Um, New York Socialist won big on climate. How does it happen? Which is a really fascinating story. Uh, in between, uh, we may get a chance to play a little bit of a debate I did last week about the anti-CRT uh, laws. Uh, well, we'll kind of see how that goes. Uh, and um, and Andy, uh, you you line this guy up. Who do, who do we have in the post game? Robert Yasamura. He uh, used to be part of the Jimmy Dore show uh, back when you could actually still watch that. <laughs> okay yeah uh and uh and he you know don't hold that against him uh that's uh he uh he left but uh in any case uh he's a comedian he's gonna be here in studio uh we are gonna be uh doing stuff like the uh talk about talking about mike lindell then uh before we bring on liza uh just a few things i want to uh i want to hit so uh the conversation i had a little while back uh with uh matt mcmanus about his book, uh, The Political Right and Equality, Turning Back the Tide of uh, Egalitarian Modernity. Uh, a, a big, long extract from that was published in Jacobin. Um, uh, the uh, political, the right says to hell with equality. Uh, really interesting conversation, covers a lot of ground. If you missed that, or even if you didn't, you know, uh, check that out in Jacobin. Uh, speaking of Jacobin, I have an article there that came out uh, today uh, would have probably been a few days ago, but they, they kind of quite rightly prioritized everything about the UAW strike over, uh, over the weekend. Uh, so it is, uh, that one is called uh, Marx engaged in rigorous analysis, but he was driven by moral outrage and it is about a uh, journalistic uh, article that uh, Marx wrote in the 1850s that I find a lot of people don't know, uh, but I think is really interesting to look at. It's called The Duchess of Sutherland and, uh, and Slavery. And uh, he is um, essentially bashing the, uh, the, uh, the wealthy lib hypocrites of his day uh, that uh, the uh, Duchess of Sutherland was this uh, Scottish aristocrat who uh, was was sort of big on uh, on condemnations of of American slavery, and you know had like Harriet Beecher Stowe, you know, like you know like held like a party for her in London and all this stuff. And of course, Marx agreed about the slavery part, but uh, he thought this was pretty rich coming from uh, the Duchess of Sutherland, and he goes into the uh, the history of the the Sutherland uh, family fortune and the uh, the way that uh, they had actually, uh, her mother-in-law, the previous Duchess of Sutherland, had actually expelled uh, 15,000 peasants from the, uh, the land that they, they grew up on, you know, the, what, what had been like the collective property of the clan in the uh, pre-capitalist uh, system in Scotland that was sort of reclassified as capitalist private property. And uh, the previous Duchess of Sutherland decided it'd be more profitable to use it as a chia, sheep pasture. Uh, and you read, you start reading the details of this thing and it is, it is grisly. It, it's like, uh, it's like district nine kind of level of expulsion. You know, they brought in the British army, uh, to, uh, to, to do it. And it's, uh, it's a really, um, it's a really blood curdling read. Marx writes from 1814 to 1820, these 15,000 inhabitants, about 3000 families were systematically expelled and exterminated. All their villages were demolished and burned down. All their fields converted into pasturage. British soldiers were commanded for this execution and came to blows with the natives. An old woman refusing to quit her hut was burned in the flames of it. Um, 
Thus, my lady uh, countess, though she was countess before she married the duke, appropriated to herself 794,000 acres of land, which from time immemorial had belonged to the clan. In the exuberance of her generosity, she allotted to the expelled natives about 6,000 acres, two acres per family. These 6,000 acres have been lying waste until then and brought no revenue to the proprietors. Uh, the countess was generous enough to sell the acre at uh, very small, you know, uh, this, you know, he, he quotes the price uh, to the clanmen who for centuries had passed, had uh, shed their blood for her family. And, you know, I think it's a really, uh, it's a really interesting article. It's a, uh, I think it's, it's a window into a side of, of Marx. I think people sometimes underplay, you know, and they, they sort of say, well, you know, Marx is doing this sort of purely scientific project. There's no moral dimension to it. And of course, Marx is engaged in descriptive analysis of how capitalism works and how he thinks the different phases of history work and all that stuff. But it's all for the purposes of this underlying commitment to socialism, which I think is absolutely a, uh, a moral commitment. And I think that comes out really strongly in uh in that in that essay and i think that i think that you get i think you get a lot from thinking about it about the way that he thought about you know the relationship between the idea that okay maybe capitalism is a necessary phase of historical development but he certainly didn't think that meant you shouldn't be mad about it um so that's in jacobin uh speaking that, of real quick that's uh basically marx's version of this you tweet tweeting at them this you question mark and then but this is actually uh, worse than usually when people say this. Yes. Now it's like <laughs> now nowadays it's like they tweeted something like kind of shitty like three years ago. This is like they literally you know committed like some kind of genocide. So <laughs> yeah, exactly, so. exactly. Yeah, it's the this you tweet, but like what it is is like it's like a it's like a police report of like all this. <laughs> <laughs> thousands of people being like yeah. burned out of their huts and all that stuff yeah actually warranted yeah yeah, yeah. now does uh d does the article or Marx at all talk about highlander the series because i believe duncan mcleod also fought against the sun just this uh no no it's a it's a big uh it's a big omission yeah um, yeah so, i'd say so, so yeah. I, I will say i don't know if duncan was still living in scotland at that point i mean this certainly long after he met up with the spaniards so you know it's a uh, uh, or no, fuck, I'm thinking of Connor. You're thinking of Connor. No, no, because no. Duncan Duncan actually did fight against uh, England and uh, the... Um, the Jacobite. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, I, I will, I, you know, this is... Uh, the this Robert the Bruce. There's quite a few episodes about Robert the Bruce. This is, this is information I have not divulged publicly in the past, but I have watched every single episode of Highland of the series, and uh, <laughs> and I, I do I do indeed remember that. Um yes. <laughs> Well, uh, speaking of things that people got a lot of uh, shit for on Twitter, but justified, unlike most of what people get shit for on Twitter, uh, I had, um, there's another Jacobin article that I would be sharing with you right now um, if events uh, hadn't intervened. So uh, last night I, um, I, I wrote and filed uh, a whole 1300 word article with Jacobin uh, entitled, or at least this was my suggested title, you know, who knows if they would have used it. Uh, Bill Maher is a scab. Uh, it is a bit of a follow-up to the Bill Maher discussion we had with Sarab last week, because uh, since then, Maher announced that he was, in fact, going to bring back the show, uh, despite, um, you know, despite the fact the strike was still going on, he was going to bring it back uh, without the writers. He said he was going to honor the spirit of the strike by, like, not doing new rules at the end. Uh, the uh, Writers Guild of America... Uh, was not impressed by the spiritual uh, honor uh, that uh, that he was uh, that he was doing there, and they they said they were going to pick the show, um, and he had all these excuses. It was because of the staff, uh, which is kind of amazing because Bill Maher's uh, net worth, uh, according to a Yahoo Finance article I found from 2021, I suppose it's possible that he really like pissed it all away since then. Uh, was, um, but they were saying $140 million. Uh, so I, I think he probably could have floated the staff for the duration of the strike. No, Ben, you've seen Club Random, which he yeah. definitely finances himself. He's blowing all of his money on that set. Yeah. You <laughs> know, you how said, much but... those, those liquor bottles? He has to keep like all those liquor just, bottles. Just the That's booze. Million dollars just right the there. booze tab coming out of that, coming out of that house. And those everything. cigars, top shelf yeah. shit. No, let me tell no you. but, but yeah, but. <laughs> But, but, but seriously, uh, yeah. Yeah, no, he, um, 
he could absolutely i mean apparently the man actually i had no idea he has like a four percent stake of the new york mets uh he um i guess he, he bought it in 2012 it's all for the yahoo finance article look i know there's a lot of bullshit about people's net worth online i've seen websites that say like my net worth is like you know there's like there's like five hundred thousand dollars which is definitely news to me and you know uh news to anybody at bank of america can see my bank account uh but uh there's uh but like you know it's a yahoo finance i do think that's probably right so um so yeah uh in any case uh so i i filed that last night but then it is not going to be published because this morning uh he announced that he is uh he's he's walking it he's walking it back uh that he um that he has caved uh he is not in fact bringing the show back at least for now um you know he sort of has this fig leaf of like oh i i said i wasn't going to do this when it looked like you know strike was just going to keep going and going but now they're back at the table so who knows you know i'll i'll i will bring it back i think he caved right to uh i to public pressure which is a good thing um you know drew barrymore uh who's going to bring her show back and and uh and the same thing happened there there was a there was a sort of um you know um uh, I mean, she had this kind of tearful, like everybody was mean to me, and then I then I backed down, um, a thing as opposed to to Bill sort of you know pretending that it had nothing to do with public backlash, but um, you know whatever. I think uh, <laughs> I'm generally not the biggest fan of uh, of uh, of public shaming, but uh, sometimes I, bullying works. I think I think there are I think there are legitimate exceptions, and uh, strike breaking is one of them. So. Um, there we have it. All right. Uh, and uh, last thing, um, last thing before we uh, we bring Liza on, uh, we have um, the. Um, so we've got on the UAW strike uh, before before we finish up on all this. Um, it has been interesting to to see the reactions to this. I think you can tell. I will say this for better or worse I mean, for better, right. For better, like that uh, the political climate has really changed for the better on this uh, that like, certainly you have people who have a lot, who have Democrats who have much less credibility on this than Rashida Tlaib uh, who are, are saying somewhat similar things uh, and, and at least rhetorically uh, back in uh, the strikers, which, you know, again, I don't, necessarily trust that this far right these are the people who invoked the railway labor act but uh but i think it's nice that the climate has at least changed enough that they feel the need to say that and there are even republicans who are trying to do some kind of weird populist triangulation um on this so uh do we have the uh the josh uh, josh holly tweet yeah so uh josh howley uh says every dime the auto industry is spending on Joe Biden's radical climate mandates should be spent on workers. Uh, they deserve better wages, better hours, and a guarantee their jobs will be safe, not shipped off to China. So uh, he's sort of trying, I guess, to express some kind of vague appearance of sympathy, at least uh, with the, the workers. But at the same time, obviously he has to make it an anti-Biden point. But uh, beyond that, you know, he he wants to blame the uh, the radical climate agenda. Yeah, it's it's amazing that uh, you know Biden has taken so much uh, from the profits of the uh, of the audio industry in his uh, in his radical climate agenda uh, to take away hamburgers from from the American people. Yeah, I guess. I mean, I would think that if we're uh, you know, if we were actually, for example, to, to really transition to, uh, electric cars, um, I mean, look, I'm no expert, but I think that you still need to build those in factories. Um, and, uh, and that that would actually, you know, the, the idea that this is, um, I think there's, a, I think there's some sort of, uh, revisionist insta history going on with the, the right wing push to sort of, uh, try to, 
try to link these even as uh even as this is going on now it's not about the pay tiers anything like that it's it's really it's really about the radical climate agenda right because they have to pick one of their you know one of their acceptable bogeymen to uh to blame this all on uh, we also have a trump thing but we're gonna wait until a little bit later i think to do that uh meanwhile speaking of the radical climate agenda uh we are now joined by liza featherstone who is a columnist for Jacobin magazine, uh, but uh, has uh, but we're talking about an article that she wrote for In These Times. How are you doing, Liza? I'm good. How are you, Ben? Good. Yeah. Uh, do we have the In These Times the, um, the graphic? Yeah, here we go. Uh, New York socialists won big on climate. Uh, how did this happen? So. Uh, this is, uh, yeah, I mean, that is a, that is a good question. I mean, we, I mean, I, I kind of thinking about like, uh, you know, we had uh, last week on the post game, you know, Matt Crispin came on and he'd said a lot of very, uh, you know, doom and gloom things. And in saying that I'm not, that's not a knock on Matt. I've, I've, I've thought <laughs> similar things many times uh, in, in my own head. Yeah, we, all, we, all, we all get like that. <laughs> uh, and uh uh, you know, but he, he did kind of say at one point, right, the sort of note of optimism was about, you know, things that could happen at a more, uh, you know, smaller scale or more local uh, level. Uh, and uh, yeah, I mean, this, this, uh, I mean, it's state, you know, anyway, they have a, uh, well, this, this, uh, this, I think uh, fits in there, but what's the, before we get to how it happened, what's the, what's the win? Give us some good news. Yeah. Um, so um, what, so what happened was, um the um, New York State passed um, um, a pretty groundbreaking piece of legislation called the Build Public Renewables Act, um, which is really what it says. Um, it mandates, not, you know, do doesn't give an option or a choice or a, you know, a possibility. It requires the state to uh, publicly fund renewable energy. So um, primarily wind and solar, solar could be some other stuff. Um, the foundation of this, um, the sort of technical foundation um, is interesting. Um, New York um, Power Authority um, was created by um, um, a, um, a, 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 gov a New York governor back in the day, um, Franklin Roosevelt. Um, so um, before um, before the New Deal and before he was the famous president, you know, he was um, the governor of New York, and at that time he created this um, this this public uh, power authority that later um, you know served as you know a, a, a somewhat of a model for Tennessee Valley Authority and other public power um, initiatives during the New Deal, which are, of course, much more famous. Mm -hmm. um, in recent years, the New York Par Power Authority wasn't really doing much of anything, and it was kind of um, run by a bunch of corrupt hacks. But um, but the, um, the Democratic Socialists looked at that and said, what can we do with that? Um, and, um, and, and it became um, a part of, um, it, be it became central to a, a demand for public power um the um and the uh, so w w now one thing it i guess i should clarify mm. this isn't a um unfortunately from uh, my my point of view because i'm also a socialist um and this isn't a um a complete public takeover of all of the utilities right mm. Like I mean that that would obviously be um, a great long term horizon for um, for socialists to have, um, the, but this is um, it. But it does it does require the state to um, build public renewables, um, and um, and that um, is a little piece of socialism in itself um, because it um, it is outside of the neoliberal logic that we mostly see climate policy um, having to resort to, like most climate policy. Um, and, you know, Joe Biden's um, climate policy, um, which I'm actually a fan of because I'm really worried about the climate apocalypse. Sure. 
and we'll just accept anything. <laughs> um, yeah. but, um, um, it's, way, but, uh, it's way better than nothing, but like, yeah, the, yeah, right. The, uh, the, um, the, the, um, but, it was uh, mostly tax breaks. Yeah, but it is. J Joe Biden's um, uh, Inflation Reduction Act is is largely incentives and tax breaks um, to, um, to you know to capitalists um, to get it done to uh, to get um, a, the, uh, the green green transition done, and um, and this is really um, a big win not only because of the potential um, carbon emissions averted, but because it does fall outside of neoliberal logic and require the energy to be created in the public interests rather than for capitalist profit. Um, that's also going to make a really huge difference potentially to working people for a couple of reasons. Um, one is, so, I mean, also I should j just say cl um, climate in general, the, um, the less, um, the less well off you are, the more climate change affects you. So it's mm -hmm. um, it's just certainly a mass working class issue, no matter how you look at it. But there are a, a couple um, specific economic ways that build public renewables is a, a big win for the working class. Um, and um, one is um, that um, in a lot of New York State, um, um, people are really being hammered by their utility bills. Um, that um, the the sort of profiteering um, of these of these utility companies um, is um, is is horrible. Um, and the um, during blackouts, the grid is unreliable because people um, the these companies don't have the incentive um, to keep it up. Um, uh, black and brown communities are particularly affected. We saw that in the blackout of 2019 in New York City. Um, and um, so, you know, these companies don't have an incentive to um, serve working people well in providing affordable and reliable energy. Um, so um, the, um, the, the, the logic is, um, is reasonable here, you know, that there should, there should be a way to take that out of the private sector um, and have the public sector do it. Um, the other thing is that, um, um, the other thing is that the, um, the legislation commits the power authority to um, building the energy in a way that, um, that creates good jobs. It creates um, very specific wage standards and um, unionization requirements. Um, yeah. so that's um, that's another big big win, um, and um, and also allows. Um, you know that um, that Josh Hawley, that incoherent Josh Hawley tweet, tweet um, was it was interesting because um, that's. Um, you know, that's, as you guys were saying, that's a frequent um, dichotomy that the right tries to set up. Um, that, and, and to some extent, the centrist, um, centrist Democrats um, do this as well, um, pitting the climate agenda against the interests of the, wor of the working people, which is a, a completely false um, dichotomy. But you know, the, um, it, it also, in a capitalist system, many things that are done do end up screwing over workers. So you actually do, when you make new policies, have to put a lot of protections in place, and 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 workers and socialists um, and um, you know and you know working people do have to build the power to make sure that that doesn't happen. Um, yeah. This, yeah. This, so this was a great example of um, you know creating um, creating climate policy that um, that really um, in, ensured um, the interests um, of of working people. Yeah, and to be fair, I mean it's not like you can't. Um, I mean, it's not like there aren't things that you could do for the sake of, of climate that uh, that really would uh, really would screw over workers or, or have right do Absolutely. right. But, yeah. And to some extent, the UAW strike um, is a little. I mean, Josh Hawley Street is not <laughs> correct, um, no. but um, but he is playing into um, the uh, the. I mean, a big issue in the UAW strike is the UAW is demanding. That um, that the electric vehicles be made in unionized plants, right? Um, and um, and and otherwise, the companies are trying to get away with making the electric vehicle transition 
on the backs of their workers. You know, yeah, like it, yeah, it's people. not it's not electric vehicles or no electric vehicles, but yeah, it's the uh, yeah who's who's gonna you know who's gonna make them, which is exactly like, exactly. Yeah. But then that's easily that fight is easily put into this frame of of climate uh, climate policy hurts the working class um, and it's just it's so important um for, it's so important to reject that um and to you know and you reject it by um expanding the horizons of what's possible it's not just it's not really um a matter of messaging so much as like actually yeah, exactly. demanding you know the goods right you <laughs> just like like yeah hard. i mean if you're if you're like uh i mean look it, it is true i mean if you're like i don't know doing like even the the like origin of the like gilet john thing in uh in france you know that like the the gas tax and stuff like yeah. that, that 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 stuff does actually you know really hurt uh working class people a lot and, and uh and obviously anytime you're changing technologies or doing something new right i mean that uh, that companies will always use that as an excuse Absolutely. to uh you know to try to you yeah. know do stuff like do things with non-unionized labor that they would have done with unionized labor or get around existing labor laws. Yeah. And, you know, and, and it is like, okay. I, I mean, they will always try to do it at working people's expense, whatever it is. And, yeah. Know, yeah so, absolutely. That, so it, it becomes so um, it's, it becomes so important to not naturalize that and yeah. you know, say, look, that's, this is what's happening and no, you can't do that. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, and you know, and, and it's it's important not just because it's like okay, obviously, like climate and you know economic uh, justice are both things that you know that we care about. So obviously, we want these to march hand in hand. But also, even if all you did care about was climate, then uh, it's you still want backlash. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> right. It's like, this is like not... yeah, you wouldn't want people to reject it. And you and the backlash is inevitable if people are not taken care of. But the other thing is, and the way it played out in the New York um in the New York bill, which I mm -hmm. thought was also so heartening, was um I mean, and, and such a, a good reason why socialists should lead on these things <laughs> rather than, you know, other people with other values. And as you uh, said earlier in the Marx segment, morals, um, you know, the um, so uh, um, at the last minute, the governor offered a watered down version of the bill uh, with all the labor provisions and the and the environmental justice provisions stripped out um and um and it was um and and i think that she thought you know well these are like you know ultimately these are really going to be climate people so they'll accept right. but of course they would not accept this because they were socialists and, you know and so they were like this is just not you know a, a bill a bill without the labor provisions and without the um, you know provisions about protecting black and brown communities from pollution like is it, it, that's just that's just not at all what we're fighting for and we wouldn't we wouldn't accept it um and um and and i think um that that was that was such an important it was so important to reject that compromise um both um because of of the morality and the rightness of it but also because um that's just um it's just such good politics you know that um, comp you always have to compromise in politics. You know, there's always some kind of compromise, uh, you know, that you, you encounter that will be distasteful in one way or another, but you should never compromise by throwing any of the people in your coalition under the bus. And, you know, right. it's like um, um, my friend Jenny Brown tells a story about how um, she was in a group that fought for the after pill and, um, and they, um, the Obama administration tried to um, tried to propose um, that okay, but it won't be available to anyone under eighteen, and you know they had young people in their coalition. They had people under eighteen in their coalition, so they were they were just like absolutely not because we are not going to throw any of um, any anyone in. In, in our political coalition under the vest, that would be so unwise, you know, and, and so, you know, they didn't accept the compromise. And, and I just think um, that's, you know, sort of, um, 
you know, people uh, um, like liberals will always say, well, you know, real, real politic, you know, get sure. serious. You know, you always have to make compromises. Yes, you do always have to make compromises, but they should never be at the expense um, of um, of your own people in your own movement that you. Yeah, that's a that's a really uh, it's a really gross example. You know, I'm going to have like a, a bunch of avoidable pregnant teenagers for the sake right? of like oh my God, <laughs> showing how responsible you are. <laughs> If you needed a flashback to how awful the Obama years were, you know, that's it just uh, it really sums it up. <laughs> yeah. But at least we at least we proved that we were, you know, we weren't like gonna be extreme about it, right? Uh right, right, right. not too extreme, just yeah. you know. awesome. Uh okay, well, yeah, let's let's talk about uh let's talk about this because like a lot of your piece is about the sort of um you know the politics, you know, kind of the logistics of of how of how this happened right so so what like let's uh i, I want to get into that i mean what uh this is uh like i mean just kind of you know just kind of at the beginning because like i know a lot of people uh you know I, I think don't have a good idea of uh i think maybe even if they live in new york they don't have a good idea you know of uh of what kind of presence you know socialists have in the 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 state uh, legislature because because that's just not as sexy i guess yeah. as like you know congress yeah. or whatever right so so it's like what would what he like like you know i i guess maybe like kind of start us there with like where, yeah. where people were, were starting off and then what they had to do to to get this to get this through in the in the better form you know that it ended up happening yeah well so um you know um not so long ago um um new uh, new york was uh what was pretty much like anywhere else in that we had no socialist representation and uh, uh, um, and the left was quite marginal um, and we had a very corrupt um, and pretty conservative um, state legislature. I think there's sort of, sometimes there's a reaction um, when we win things in New York, people will say, you know, okay, whatever, but that's New York as if mm -hmm. it's, you know, and they'll say it in the same way that they might say, well, that's Cuba or that's, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Berkeley, California. It's like, no, actually, it was nothing like that. Like, I mean, it was really pretty much like everywhere. Like there were, um, you know, we, we, we just we, we were largely run by a bunch of corrupt machine hacks. Right. Um, um, and um, just like your city, wherever you are now listening. <laughs> so, um, it, probably. Um, and uh, um, and the. Um, the Bernie Sanders campaign, what, um, the two campaigns, 2016 and 2020, um, were um, had a huge impact um, on um, on New York. Um, Bernie is a born and raised in Brooklyn. You know, there's, I think there was a little bit of an awakening of, of our of our cultural heritage there with with socialism, um, and um, the. Uh, um, so um, tremendous growth of um, DSA, Democratic Socialists of America, in New York. Um, the um, um, one of the things, another another of the things that happened during that period was um, we had a um, huge um, grassroots um, overthrow of a very corrupt um, group of conservative Democrats um, in Albany um, who. Um, um, it's so nice. I can barely remember their name. They were the Independent Democratic, <laughs> and um, and and they really made almost all um, progressive change in New York State um, impossible. Um, they would generally caucus with the Republicans. Um, the um, and and it wasn't widely understood, so there was very little resistance um, to them. Um, and um, and. Um, in 2018, um, you know, partly on this wave of kind of Bernie-inspired optimism, um, there was a there was a, a lot of organizing, and um, these people were displaced um, and replaced um, by more um, more progressive Democrats. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, that same year, um, a Democratic socialist um, named Julia Salazar also ran for state senate and won her seat um, and that was the first she was the first um, socialist um, to be um, elected in new york state in 
almost a hundred years. Actually, not not that's not quite true because um, Charles Barron um, is a, um, a, a was a veteran socialist who's um, been in there for a long time. But he's not he he was not with DSA or any specific um, like well known organization. Um, so it's, it's it's a bit different. And no doubt there were other legislators with somewhat socialistic values, sure. um, but. But as far as sort of organized um, or organized democratic socialism, um, the Julia's election was was novel, um, and um, and then um, something else that happened as part of the context that same year, um, Ali, Alexandra Ocasio Cortez was elected um, congresswoman um, of New York. Um, all of these things created a sense of left possibility and put socialism back into the political language. Um, something that was especially significant about AOC's election, um, um, and yeah, and I heard your long caveat about about the squad, but sort of sure. his, as far as historical yeah, yeah, yeah. go, um, the um, she articulated. Um, uh, her articulation of the Green New Deal mm -hmm. was incredibly important because for, um, for the first time, um, someone was a, a, a prominent politician holding an elected office at the federal level was um, describing how the um, um, how what what the green economic future might look like um, and how it would be socialistic in some sense you know and um and 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 really um and it was novel um because of that and it was also novel simply because someone was finally um describing a solution that was at the scale of the problem mm -hmm. a phrase that aoc herself used a lot the scale of the problem um and um and that was um incredibly influential among the um the climate movement which had um, really been sort of stuck fighting about international treaties and um, which you know is hard was hard for people to see the relevance to their own lives um, you know and really getting stuck on small bore things like let's save this one particular species you know all very important but uh, you know but it was very um, it, it, the, the the green New Deal really brought together um, a much more inspiring vision for um, how um, how climate um, how how the decarbonized economy could be a positive um, socialist vision um, and give us all a better life um, and um, so with all of that happening um, the um, the the DSA started thinking okay what um, for those of us who are, are really want to work on climate, um, what would a socialist can climate campaign look like? Um, what would um, and what could we conceivably win? What could we fight for and conceivably win? What's the biggest thing we could fight for and conceivably win? Which is a great question. You know, what is the biggest thing we could fight for and win? Because you can always think of what's the biggest thing you could fight for, right? And you can always think of, you know, okay, what we could probably win, you know, and, um, and you know, those the answer to the first thing is usually going to be too big. And the answer to the second thing is usually going to be too small. So like, but what's the biggest thing that we could win is a really good question. Um, and so they, uh, so, so yeah, they, we can, uh, we can think of fully automated luxury communism. We can, uh, exactly. you know, we can exactly. get a 10 cent pay raise. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yes. Right. Exactly. Um, so, um, so, 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 so they hit on, um, um, after um, a lot of, a lot of discussion, they hit on, um, the um, the idea of public power of a, of pu like a of public publicly owned um, power and um, and they were inspired in part there was a campaign in Providence Rhode Island before this um, it, um, called um, nationalize grid which is a good one um, a, a good a good slogan of playing off national grid company mm -hmm. um, and um, um, and um, and 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 after a and after a while, the sort of winnable version of that 
um, became focused on the New York Power Authority, which is, as I explained, this this FDR um, vestige um, that um, that hadn't um, been living up to its potential, um, and um, and um, the um, and so how they did it. Um, there, there was a, one of the things that I think is so um, wonderful about this story is there was so much trial and error, um, and um, and there was um, very little um, dogmatic attachment to any one method, you know. And um, so they did a lot of grassroots organizing, canvassing, trying to get people to call um, their legislators once they had the idea for the bill. Um, and um, and actually they had had a lot of success, GSA had had a lot of success with exactly that tactic on two previous bills. Um, there had been a, a big victory on tenants' rights in 2019. Um, and there had been in 2020, the, um, Tax the rich, um, which um, um, which was really fun. Um, I, I did a little I did a little campaigning on that, and it was it's just a really fun demand. People love it, um, and um, you know, and um, and that, so there was a, we had a lot of success with both of those the, um, those campaigns on the um, um, on the getting people to call their legislators. Um, by the time of build, build public renewables. The legislators were jaded to this tactic, <laughs> so um, the, the the first two worked so well because New York politics had been so desiccated and so um, corrupt and so alienating to people that uh, legislators had been very unaccustomed to getting calls from yeah. people at all. <laughs> you know, so it really freaked them out when they did um, those first two campaigns, but then. By the time Build, Build Public Renewables rolled around, they were like, okay, these people, like, you know, and they would just send the calls to voicemail and not really care. Um, so the tactic no longer worked. And so so the socialists kind of had to pivot. Okay, what um what what can what can we do? This is not working. Um and um and um and they they tried a lot um of other things um they um one of the things that they did that was um you know they tried to get um they tried to get legislators to co-sponsor the bill they tried to get legislators to sign on they found that um they found that people were reluctant to sign on because the um, the um, the lead sponsor of the bill hadn't explicitly asked them. This is sort of an yeah, right. insidery, you know, um, legislative thing. Um, and um, and you know, and then then they started asking questions. Okay, why hasn't he asked them to? And they looked at um, and and they looked at his. Um, you know his campaign contributions, and he was getting a lot of money from the uh, from the utility companies, from the fossil fuel industry. He had every reason um, not to move this bill forward. Quite possibly, he'd even taken it on specifically to sit on it. You know, and um, and and be a, a obstructionist in that way. So they did a very unusual and controversial thing, which is controversial both within DSA and within the coalition. Um, they decided to run a primary challenge against the lead sponsor of their own bill. <laughs> yeah, which is which is crazy. I mean, this is the, yeah, this yeah. Is the most striking thing in the yes. article because, I mean, this is like, um, I mean, I'll, always like fascinated when stuff like this mm -hmm. works, right? It's like the, it's like when, uh, you know, it's like, uh, you know, when, um, you know, the Chris Smalls and the ALU, you know, like succeeded yeah. uh, unionizing the warehouse in Staten Island, like, if you look at the details of what they did, like a lot of this stuff that sort of like, uh, you know, seasoned organizer, realistic kind of can, you know, conventional mm -hmm. wisdom, like, like, you know, and, and not like, from, yeah. and not in a sort of, uh, 
you know, and not in a sort of like bureaucrat show way, but like from people that we like, uh, yeah. you know, is like, oh, well, you have to wait until you have like a certain threshold of how many people are signed on before you do this. You know, this is this is like a lot of the no shortcut stuff. And it's like fascinating to like look at how many shortcuts they took uh, and, uh, and how and how it worked right in, uh, in, in that instance. And I mean, this has like a little bit of that fa- that uh, that feel to it. Right. So. So, yeah, tell yeah. Me about this, this primary challenge. Yeah, um, and so, um, so so they so they ran um, a great um, um, uh, a great candidate against um, against this this guy Kevin Parker and they um, and the socialist opponent was David Alexis, um, a rideshare driver and organizer. Um, you know, lived in Flatbush. Um, you know, his kids suffered from asthma. Really angry about pollution. Um, wonderful, really um, smart socialist. Uh, I read about him for the Nation actually at the time, um, and um, um, and he did not win. Um, but um, he it was a great campaign, and he got a lot of support, and he really scared um, Kevin Parker, um, the um, recalcitrant um, um, uh, senator who was sitting on the bill. Um, and um, Kevin Parker did introduce the bill um, and he, um, he pretty much used um, DSA's talking points in arguing for it eventually. Um, and um, and so um, so in that sense, that was real a real success. They also used electoralism in another way, um, which was they ran quite a few other eco-socialist candidates. Um, and um, because they decided they really needed to um, run people who were explicitly dedicated to this goal. Um, and um, and the, in many ways, um, that strategy in the moment looked like a failure because they ran a whole bunch of candidates and most of them didn't win. And up till, you know, and, you know, DSA really it runs candidates to win. They don't yeah. run candidates for symbolic, you know, right. um, purposes. Um, and um, and so so within DSA to have most of them not win is really like, what are you even doing? It looks it looks really disappointing. Um, but um, the other candidate that the 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 campaigns really did get the information out there about the legislation because that is something that a political campaign can do. You're just knocking on doors. You're really talking to everybody. Um, but the other thing was one of their uh, campaigns that did win um, was um, Sarahana Sreshla, who I also wrote about for the Nation um, at the time, um, and um, she. Um, she really championed the bill. She was running in the Hudson Valley where people really suffer with their utility bills. They have a horrible utility company there. People were so mad about it. They wanted to just talk all day about it and they wanted to um, make um, sure that she got elected and did something about it. Um, and, um, and she really, um, she she really took it. She really took it on. She won, um, so um, she she won by so much and so surprisingly that um, that actually um, her um, she actually um, catapulted to victory um, a, a, a mediocre Democrat um, who was running for Congress um, in a quite close race against a Republican um, because she caused so much turnout to happen from all, all of the organizing around her and around the VPRA. Um, so that was kind of a, 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 a nice unintended consequence. Um, and, um, and she, uh, um, so once elected, she also she really championed the bill within the legislature, um, and um, and and was really um, devoted to it. So in 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 that in that way, um, the electoralism also um, was um, was effective. But you know, people often within the socialist movement will will counterpose. You know, well. You know, like electoralism is really important. No, labor is even labor organizing is even more important. It's like, 
Well, in this case, yes and yes, um, because um, labor was also really crucial to passing this bill. Um, and, um, you know, um, DSA members within their unions um, championed and got their unions to back it more strongly. I know I personally did that and um, and many of us mm -hmm. did. Um, and, um, and then, and also um, the, um, the some of some key unions supporting the bill really um, brought on the Democratic legislators. So um, one that was particularly important was New York State, um, to, uh, the NYSET New York State Teachers Union um, mm -hmm. endorsing it was a really pivotal pivotal um, in that was that was huge. Um, and um, 1199, another really huge um, union. Um, mm -hmm. and, and then, you know, so they actually came on board um, because of the environmental justice provisions, which is sort of, you know, something surprising that one wouldn't necessarily predict. Um, but, um, but some of their members lived in some of these um, neighborhoods in the Bronx that um, near these peaker plants that the um, bill was proposing to, um, to remove, um, you know, and so, you know, and so, so another, another lesson of this is like, um, there are just so many, um, there, there are just so many um, reasons um, why um, people might come together on something, then they're not always even entirely predictable. Right. Uh, so I, I guess, um, I guess maybe the last thing I'd, I'd ask you about this and everybody should, uh, everybody should check out the article, which is up on the, uh, in these times uh, website, uh, New York socialists, a uh, one big on climate, how did it happen? But is, you know, okay. So, so part of how they were able to do this, the way that they did it is that uh, there is, you know, there's this, uh, there's this public power uh, agency mm -hmm. in, uh, in, in New York. That's like this relic from, you know, when FDR uh, was, uh, was governor and obviously they don't have that everywhere else, but I mean, to what extent is this something that can be replicated everywhere else? Absolutely, and this is a great question. Um, and um, and um, and in fact, um, it really doesn't much matter that other states don't have this. Um, and um, and and in, and and one of the things that uh, the other elements that was um, decisive, um, or, or that was that was really really important, was um, the Inflation Reduction Act passed while all of this was going on, um, and. Um, and that legislation that has it has so many things in it that we don't know about. It's actually it's it's a big political problem for Biden how much <laughs> the people don't know <laughs> is in this bill. Um, but um, but um, but it's also kind of a problem for all of us because it has useful things in it that we should know about. Um, and um, and one of them is um, there is federal money in there for any cover any state city municipality school board you know basically any public entity that wants to create renewable energy there is money in the inflation reduction act for them to do so so this um this create so first of all in the context of build, build public renewables this was great because it became um, a good talking point that was persuasive to many legislators to say, oh, if we don't do this, we're leaving money, federal money on the table. We're missing out on this money, on this money we could get more interest. So that was, that was very helpful and convincing, but what's also um, really uh, um, what I love about that is it really means anyone anywhere could do a campaign like this um, because um, because that money is there and that case is to be made. Nice. Well, uh, I hope uh, <laughs> to, uh, yeah, that's, uh, you know, I, I hope uh, lots of people do make that cases in, yeah. uh, in, uh, in lots of places to, uh, to, to paraphrase uh, Che Guevara, one, two, three, many BPRA. Right. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so yeah, thank you so much, uh, Liza. Everybody should check out our article in uh, in these times. Thank you so much, Ben.
All right. Uh, so we are uh, going to uh, play the interview again. I had to pre-record this uh, with uh, with Will Meneker in uh, in just a minute. Uh, but before we do that, uh, we have one uh, one cash, you know, one check to cash because we did this whole thing about the UAW strike and reactions to it uh, and. I know the one question on everybody's minds is uh, what about uh, former president uh, Donald John Trump? Uh, what uh, what did he have to say about this? Let's talk about the economy. And I want to start by talking about this big standoff between the auto workers and the big three auto manufacturers. Yeah. My question for you, Mr. President, whose side are you on in this? Uh, I'm on the side of uh, making our country great. Uh, the auto workers uh, are not going to have any jobs when you come right down to it, because if you take a look at what they're doing with electric cars, electric cars are going to be made in China. The auto workers are not going to have any. I'll tell you what, the auto workers are being sold down the river by their leadership, and their leadership should endorse Trump. The reason is you got to have choice. Like in school, I want school choice. I also want choice for cars. If somebody wants gasoline, if somebody wants all electric, they can do whatever they want. But they're destroying the consumer and they're destroying the auto workers. The auto workers will not have any jobs, Kristen, because the, all of these cars are going to be made in China. The electric cars automatically are going to be made in China. So let's talk about UAW's leadership. The president, Sean Fain, has withheld his endorsement of President Biden. But this is what he had to say about you. Quote, another Donald Trump presidency would be a disaster. How would you win that endorsement? Well, if that's the case, I probably won't win his. And I don't know the gentleman, but I know his name very well. And I think he's not doing a good job in representing his union because he's not going to have a union in three years from now. Those jobs are all going to be gone because all of those electric cars are going to be made in China. <laughs> He was, uh, 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 the actual clip cut him off, but I, th I think he was saying China, right? I think that's what he was saying. I assume. I, I believe so. Yeah, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, they, uh, they say in Harlan County, there are no neutrals there. You'll either be a union man or a thug for GH Blair. Uh, so yeah. Uh, when you're asked that question, uh, which side are you on? Uh, I'm on the side of making America great is, uh, not an answer. No, <laughs> no. And I also love the whole like uh, the unions will be sent down the river if they endorse me or something like that. It it was a little muddled, you know. Like, like you could tell, it was completely off the cuff. Trump, which which I truly miss. Um, yes, <laughs> uh, I, I like I like that he threw in that I know his name very well. It's like he he just wanted to be to be clear. I've heard of this guy before. Yeah, it could be that Irish uh, political party. I'm not sure. Uh, been hearing lots about that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sinn Féin also yet to endorse Donald Trump. Um, Famous yeah. <laughs> but yeah, he's talking about that there's going to be all of this outsourcing, right? But isn't so much, I, I feel like, wouldn't he claim to support uh, penalizing companies that do outsourcing, or I guess he's being honest about it, which is that he wouldn't do he wouldn't do a thing about that, right? He's saying that the the costs are going to go up too high, and there's not going to be any jobs in America, uh, which would seemingly go against what he believes. Right? Yeah, yeah, it's it's confusing. Um, I mean, yeah, there was net outsourcing under his presidency, uh, and even even before COVID, uh, and. Um, and I mean, it is also, I mean, it, I mean, it's actually like legitimately very gross. I mean, before the, uh, bef you know, like during the 2016 election, he literally went to Youngstown and like went to, to uh, you know, where <laughs> it's where my mom grew up, uh, you know, spent a lot of time going to, uh, you know, visiting my grandparents there growing up and what often felt sort of uh, like about as close as American cities get to post-apocalyptic Uh and, um, and, you know, with the, where the like Lordstown, uh, you know, plant was, uh, you know, he was, he went there and told people that the jobs were coming back. In fact, he told people don't sell your house. Uh, cause, uh, cause, cause I'm gonna, I'm gonna bring the jobs back and, uh, you know, citation needed, uh, that's, uh, that, uh, that, that, that sure didn't happen. 
And, uh, and obviously uh, he was a massive union buster and deregulator as, uh, as president. So it's very unsurprising that Sean Fain uh, thinks he would be a disaster if he got a second bite at the apple. Uh, but, uh, but I mean, Fain has, I mean, and this is, I mean, we we're talking about legitimate criticism of the squad earlier. It's like, look, I, I think that the sort of, you know, endorsing Biden right away. I mean, it's like, this isn't, you don't have to be like Jimmy Dore to think that's a bad idea. That's, that's, uh, like, you know, there's a reason that, that Sean Fain, the UAW have like the UAWs, uh, withheld, uh, their, their endorsement of, uh, of, of Biden precisely because they want some of these guarantees, about, you know, electric cars being made with, you know, unionized labor and, you know, and all this stuff. Right. Like, and, uh, and that's, that's good. And again, that's a lot of, you know, I mean, that is the, the, that is part of what the, uh, what the strike is about. And, but like, just for Trump to portray it, I mean, I obviously I'm just repeating what Liza said, but I mean, for Trump to portray it as EVs or no EVs, as opposed to like where they're made and by who, is uh is is just it's it's you know whatever i mean far be it for me to suggest that donald trump would be dishonest but you know i i think it's uh i think it's i think it falls short of accuracy and not even as good as uh shakespeare i mean you know uh ev or not tv is not the question no exactly that's not the question all right well um so on uh on the subject of uh of donald trump uh I talked to Will Menneker about, I think, every single uh, Republican candidate except for Donald Trump uh, since since we were kind of talking about the uh, the field, right? You know, the sort of the people who are going through the motions of running for president who uh, I suppose are running for, uh, for being the Republican nominee if Trump dies. Uh, but uh, in any case, uh, we talk about that. We talk about, uh, you know, Thomas Friedman and how saw uh our friend tom from yakubia made the joke in the chat earlier the uh the next six months will be decisive in ukraine uh this is the uh this is the line that tom freeman uh uh incessantly repeated uh throughout the war in iraq you know that like it was going to turn around in uh in the next six months so uh so yeah do we have the uh the screen share ready for uh the the will benneker pre-record All right. I'm now joined by uh, Will Menneker, who is one of the, uh, you know, he is a co-host of Chapa Trap House, but somehow he doesn't live in Los Angeles. He uh, he remains a stubborn East Coast holdout. Just a kid from New York. That's me. Glad to be here, Ben. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I'm, I'm excited we could uh, we could do this. Uh, so I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I think about when I first started listening to Chapo in, uh, 2016 and, uh, you guys were obviously covering the, uh, the primaries. Uh, I actually remember, I, I think I started listening to it like a, a few months into the existence of the show. So like some of it was already kind of depressing because it was, you know, there's a lot of like, Oh, Hey, you know, birdie might, uh, might pull this out. Uh, stuff that uh, that didn't, uh, you know, sadly didn't turn out. But uh, but yeah, I am curious now that we're like a little bit into the uh, the Republican primary. There isn't any meaningful Democratic primary, unfortunately, uh, this year. You know, since the uh, since the the very coherent Democratic message that uh, democracy is on the line, and also um, you know, if Joe wants to run again, who are you to gain say that? um is uh is in place but uh we do have a republican primary and i was I, you know i thought it might be interesting to just kind of run through uh run through the republican candidates and uh and get the the will Menneker thoughts you know we, we do a lot of uh sort of uh you know bigger picture stuff on the show talk about capitalism and socialism and all that stuff but you know sometimes it's fun to just do this so um okay talk about the damn the damn horse race or the, you know or it's like a, the characters that are on your television you know the 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 the, 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 the men and women featured in the stories that we watch on tv and you know i guess I, we should preface this by saying yeah like there there certainly is not any meaningful democratic primary but there isn't a republican one either uh, that's i mean true. Like, this that's is true. <laughs> this is just i mean like all of this is just a complete afterthought nobody is getting close to donald trump nobody <laughs> 
nobody is nobody is going to is, is going to sniff him in the, in this primary. But that being said, I mean the character is you know there there's there some good character. It's always fun to see who piles out of like the Munster family house to uh, <laughs> run for president, particularly on the Republican side. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there is something like you're right. I mean, they're 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 sort of going through the motions in the Republican primary in a way that they're not in the Democratic primary. They're they're debates, but um, it is all sort of strangely pointless. Uh, and because ob yes, obviously, you know, obviously it's Trump. I mean, Trump is. Uh, proven he could literally just not acknowledge the process at all and it doesn't matter you know he's still winning it's really hard to see like short of him just having a heart attack or something it's it's really hard to see how any of these guys could uh you know could uh could actually pull it off but fuck it let's uh let's talk about the characters so i mean the one you know like if we we're having this conversation like a couple months ago the one that everybody would treat as like, oh yeah, he might actually like threaten Trump in some way, is the uh, the governor of a yes. uh, state that I lived in for several years, uh, Florida, uh, Ron uh, Ron DeSantis, Ronnie, Ronnie D. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, yeah, like I mean, uh, we we just had um, uh, the uh, Josh who runs the Twitter account and Substack Ettinger Mentum on the yeah. show. And, you know, he's he's a he's an astute uh, elections watcher. And I think the moment that like the, the thing that sums up everything in the Ron DeSantis campaign was his camp. The fact that he decided to launch his campaign for president to announce. I mean, everyone knew he was running for uh, sure. years, but like to officially launch his presidential campaign, he chooses to launch it on Twitter back when it was still Twitter. But like <laughs> basically to, to basically to test out Twitter's capacity to live stream video. And like and just giving over his entire announcement video to Elon Musk was so like grating and servile and also a complete disaster. But like the way Josh talked about it is like on paper, this looked like, you know, the Christopher Walken dead zone moment where like, you know, you, you shake Martin Sheen's hand and then you see like the, the missiles are flying um, because, you know, it's like one of the richest men in the world who's like, yeah. you know, uh, just bought a you know significant communications platform and is in the process of turning it into like a right wing media organ uh, yeah. combined with, you know, like a, a fairly popular, but like extremely right wing governor who's like, you know, even like die hard on the message of, you know, like a hardcore right wing social conservatism and let's end schools and, you know, uh, ship gay people into, you know, zoos or whatever. Sure, and sure. like, and, you know, like the, 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 this did seem like a, you know, a dead zone style nightmare, but like it, it all just deflated so quickly. And, uh, you know, obviously like any one of these Cretans being president yeah. is a nightmare. I mean, reality is a nightmare, but DeSantis is just the thing that I find fascinating about him, I guess, is just that like uh, all of the things that make him, uh. Like the same the same as every other Republican who's ever like run for president or would run for president in 2024. Um, it, like, is it is a detriment to him? But all the things that make him uniquely run are even more of a detriment to him, because like it's just it's just a guy who like uh, it's, it's actually kind of impressive how much political power and how high how high he has climbed in the American political system, despite really not wanting to talk or touch any other human being ever. Like he just seems to have an aversion to like relating to other human beings and just and I know I know it's all bullshit, you know, like uh, how we want our candidates to be people that you want to have a beer with. But like yeah. it's not total bullshit because like what is the American presidency to like the average person like it other than like, can, OK, we're giving this guy the nuclear codes like is this someone I could have a beer with? And like, yeah. like, that, like, that's the trust that you want to imagine yourself placing in the hands of someone who could like end human the civilization. Idea of with the, you're with yeah, Santos is excruciating. It's, it's fuck, oh, fucking uh, stomach to, revolting to imagine. And, yeah. and 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 as bad as it would be for you, it would be even worse for him. I mean, <laughs> I, I've that's we I've joked the show that like I want to send his campaign a gift basket for just like providing us with cheap comedy material throughout the, you know, utter doldrums of this past year, trying to have find anything entertaining to talk about in politics in American politics or this presidential race that's still, you know, a year away. And just like the clips of him trying to interact with people or like someone will tell them like, oh, like he'll just be like, what's your name? And they'll be like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm Tom or whatever. And he goes, cool. Or thanks. Okay, <laughs> bye. Like just the way he can't hold a, a, like even a fake smile on his face for like more than 30 seconds and for it having 
it just drop off his head like you know just like dandruff like just falls off his face yeah it seemed like there was a while where he was smiling a lot more like you got the sense that some consultant had told him that he wasn't smiling enough and then maybe they thought better of it and no yeah they did <laughs> He, they, yeah, you got to let Ron be Ron to a certain point. You can't, you can't get it. You can't press him to do anything too uh, horrifyingly inauthentic, like you know, talk to another human being or seem to enjoy himself for longer than ten seconds. But I don't know. I mean, I guess like he, he is. I guess like a, a yeah. vision of where the Republican Party is going, at least on like a media level, because like I think he is authentically like an ideologically committed authoritarian dork. Right. Like I think yeah. that that's. Those are the people that he courts the respect of. I mean, I'm, I'm sort of cribbing from uh, Josh, who was uh, on our program, who wrote the definitive three-part uh, Ron DeSantis, The Art of Losing piece that sort of chronicles his entire career from like being a JAG lawyer to a congressman to his first run for Senate, his run for Senate, and then eventually winning uh, the governor's, uh, governor's race. And I think like it, the point he makes is that like when he became governor of Florida and he became a very popular governor in Florida by... Um, basically contrasting himself with Rick Scott, who was like, you know, this this awful Tea Party, like, you know, Medicare thief who mm -hmm. made a bit who, like and there was like there's an interesting uh, example that he, he writes about in this article about the issue of Florida's red tide problem, Ugh. which um, uh, Rick Scott made, you know, like an effort not to do anything about. And Ron DeSantis sort of came into office governing and just sort of appearing to be basically a both sides, like he appointed Democrats to state offices or for like our various uh, state um, offices um, and became very popular, appearing to be a kind of bipartisan moderate Republican. But then like when the world is, is his oyster and he thinks like now is my time to be run, the people he surrounds himself with and the issues that like he's made his own are like basically he wants to impress Ben Shapiro, not the average American voter. Like that's what he believes in. That's who he is. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, and, and in a way that's like, I think probably says something, I don't know, maybe something kind of obvious about why Trump did and didn't get it uh, last time, because um, like the whole Ron DeSantis pitch is like he's running for people who like get excited about pleasing Ben Shapiro or like who are like, I don't know, super active right wing Twitter users that like he he seems to think that, you know, you're going to get Republican primary voters really, really excited by talking about um, right wing policy. And uh, and it, it just doesn't seem to like yeah. that, that seems obviously like, well, not what, yeah, it's like. Whether you're talking about like uh, the the uh, Bernie left or like yeah. you know, uh, democratic socialists in America, or yeah. they're, like they're you know right wing equivalent of like you know Groypers or people for whom like neo Nazi imagery would they'd be like oh yeah Ron DeSantis is a Nazi Patrick Bateman and I identify with that and that's good that's a good thing to be to me. The thing is, what unites both these groups of people is neither of them own houses or basically have any clout or fucking like any real purchase on the electoral process or like the type of people politicians care about what they think or fucking try to appeal to. Yeah, I mean, like, I mean, and, and I think that he's kind of stopped doing it a little bit. I mean, but just the way that uh, Ron, like every other word out of his mouth was woke, like, uh, I, I just think, you know, I think there's like a reason that didn't land. I mean, I think actually like Donald Trump, when he was like, you know, woke, I, I, I don't know what that means. You know, like that's like, I, he, I, yeah. you know, like he doesn't have, he doesn't have to talk about it. He can just be about it. You know, like he doesn't <laughs> have to talk about, like, you know, complain about wokeness or cancel culture. Mm. I mean, he, he does talk about cancel culture because now he's talking about they indicted me because he's a real one. He's not getting canceled. He's getting hit with 90 felonies. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like Trump can just be Trump, and like his very existence is 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 uh, is a blasphemy to the to to the, to the woke people. So like he doesn't need to to bitch about it all the time like Ron does, which makes people makes you kind of honestly. If you talk about wokeness enough, you just start to become woke. You just start to if not in if not in the actual content of your belief. No, but you but you style. become annoying in exactly the same yeah, way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, that's I think definitely true. Uh, before we leave the state of Florida. Uh, should just take uh, take a moment to uh, just a beat for uh, Miami Mayor Francis Suarez, who uh, who who dropped out. He, oh, really? Uh, he, yeah, oh. yeah. He, he oh, shot man. his shot. But he decided that it wasn't going to happen. 
Well, uh, I mean, like at least he can dedicate himself full time to Miami coin, the cryptocurrency that will revolutionize municipal funding. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, well, you know, if uh, if Ron is yesterday's news and uh, Francis uh, was never any news, I guess today's news is uh, Vivek, uh, Vivek yeah. uh, Ramaswamy. Well, I mean, where to start with this guy? I mean, like, OK, I'll, uh, probably probably I don't, I don't know. It's hard to say whose voice is more annoying, his or Ron DeSantis. But I think I'm going to give an edge to Ron DeSantis. But like Vivek's yeah, yeah. whole whole shtick is deeply annoying. I mean, he just seems like like lab created. He, he's the. I guess sort of like the, the right wing Pete Buttigieg, but like, I don't think he's even like, I, I, I think he's like naturally right wing in his beliefs, but I don't think he really believes anything. I think, I mean, like was, he's the guy who got rich peddling some fake Alzheimer's drug and then like just busted out the company. Goodfellas style. Thousands of people lost their jobs, not to mention, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> promoting a fake cure for Alzheimer's. Yeah. Uh, and I mean, he does like, OK, obviously uh, the facts that he, you know, like he wrote his book uh, was a woke ink or something like that. Uh, yeah. He was he was another person who was going to try talking about wokeness all the time and then you know, thought better of it. But uh, like in there, I mean, he he says all this stuff about like Trump in January 6th to like try to position himself as this like, oh, I'm a conservative. I hate wokeness. But, yeah, you know, yeah. Don't be wrong. I don't like that guy. And, you know, now it seems like, you know, he's pretty blatantly running for, I don't know, vice president or secretary of transportation or whatever, you know, whatever yeah. Trump feels like getting him. I mean, this is the point Felix has made about uh, Vivek, but like he has been clever in so much as that like he is very much auditioning to be like i'm i'm the cool millennial donald trump or like you know yeah. I'm, the, I'm the i'm out i'm filling the outsider like lane in, in in a republican presidential primary but like he's been very despite the fact that like you said like when i mean you know he's licked his finger and stuck it to the wind after january 6 and was like okay i have to like distance myself from this and then of course, now is just like he's like, well, I would have handled it differently. But I, he, what he says now about January 6th is that like, oh, he wouldn't have done it, but he would have started running for president like that day. And I'm like, OK, great. Thanks. But um, with him, though, like he he doesn't really talk about Trump that often. And like he doesn't like he, he tries to like stay away from Donald Trump and just uh -huh. let, let other people fill in the gaps in their head rather than like sweatily trying to like ask for an endorsement. Or, or like say or just consciously copy him too much yeah no i think that's right i mean at the debate of course he said um that there was um like he was sort of i i, I guess maybe this is a joke i didn't quite get like that he he sort of introduced himself by like self-consciously copying obama like, yeah where he was like who's this skinny brown kid with a funny name why why is he up here yeah I mean, I think yeah. he's he's crib he's cribbing a lot from Peter Buttigieg and Andrew Yang, I think. But like, I mean, like his actual personality and beliefs are somehow even more repellent than Pete Buttigieg and Andrew Yang's. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, he's got this mantra that he uh, he repeats a lot. Um, he seems to think works really well for him because he finds ways to wedge it in a lot of different places. His like list of like you know it's like the uh, oh yeah 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 I it's, was it's like that it's like that spoken word album that Homer Simpson has the this I believe <laughs> oh, the, right? the, yeah. the, the, these things I believe yeah <laughs> by Johnny Calhoun <laughs> who jumped to the top of the charts with I want to dream genie in a magic bikini but yeah no <laughs> I, I like to like uh, the, the, like number two like God is real there are two genders. <laughs> like, this is like his uh yeah his like uh moses with the ten commandments and reverse racism is racism and my i think my favorite one is that uh was it like a uh, human flourishing requires fossil fuel man i really hope not <laughs> yeah yeah no i mean like i guess <laughs> for like the present the, the, this immediate the second yeah it'd be pretty terrifying to imagine if that all that went away but <laughs> for I mean, the, if human for flourishing the, for the, for the requires future, fossil fuels, yeah. that's a pretty <laughs> yeah. bleak vision. Of <laughs> and also, like we we've only been burning fossil fuels for like a couple hundred years, like not that long. Human civilization has flourished many times before, and you know, probably maybe will again. But for the foreseeable yeah, I, future, I mean, yeah. Unless, like, one of the unless the like unless Vivek has some sort of belief that there are an unlimited supply of fossil fuels, uh, 
like it, it just seems like if human flourishing requires it, we're not going to flourish, you know, yeah. like for very long, kind of regardless. I don't know, maybe he believes in ancient aliens or something like that. Uh, I hope so. Yeah. Um, seven is also good. Uh, the nuclear family is the greatest form of governance uh, known to mankind. Once again, uh, like a fairly a fairly new invention, <laughs> like so similar yeah. to burning fossil fuels. But you know, hey, Ugh. if it ain't uh, broke, don't fix it. Yeah, I guess. Uh, capitalism uh, lifts people up uh, from uh, from poverty, so it's staking out the the pro capitalism lane in the Republican primary. Bold of him to do that. Uh, there are three branches of government, not four. I guess that's a reference to. Uh, the um the that's state. like yeah yeah <laughs> uh yeah i saw i this is really masochistic but i i actually watched uh his uh club random appearance oh excellent oh my god yes oh he was he was just on club random vivek yeah oh he's the perfect guest he's the perfect guest <laughs> how like how low like how low or high on the dreyfus scale was he sitting in in the club random uh sofa chair yeah he was pretty he was pretty like his legs were pretty splayed out uh as i mm. recall um but yeah it was uh i mean it was funny like what like what bill was like uh scandalized about and wanted to fight about like a lot of trump stuff and like i think uh i think he thought it was crazy that vivek uh wanted to uh you know wants to like abolish the fbi um that's the that's the thing that like you know really bothered him and they spent a while arguing about whether you could replace it with like expanding the u.s marshals which is the uh the vivek yes that's what that's what that's what we should do should it be all Raylan Givens? All Raylan Givens is put that they really need one federal law enforcement agency, and it's the U.S. Marshals, the cool guys. Yeah. Well, that would obviously be much better than the FBI. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But, but it's like all the shit that like Vivek says that doesn't the get. FBI's gone up. woke. The FBI is woke. The U.S. Marshals are based, <laughs> and all other federal law enforcement is cringe and cope. Yeah, I mean, this is confusing to me on kind of a fundamental level because, I mean, one of the things I thought I understood about conservatives was that, like, right there with God is real and there are only two genders was that cops are good. Yeah. Yeah, but, but you know what? Like, uh, federal cops are, have never been good for the right wing. You know, they've never liked the, the ATF, FBI. And you know what? Good on them. I don't, I don't like all these these federal law enforcement agencies. I think we should get rid of the, the FBI. But what Vivek wants is essentially to replace the FBI with, like, the sheriff's departments who are... Like, you know, all in Nazi gangs or whatever. <laughs> yes. Um, and, you know, and certainly, like, I mean, the, the stuff that didn't didn't come up uh, was like, I don't know. I mean, Vivek also has said stuff. He said it at the debate, right, that he wants to, like, uh, send drones to, like, assassinate, like, Mexicans trying to cross the U.S. Mm -hmm. border. Yeah. Like, no, it's like uh, as as the Republican Party now becomes obviously, of course, you know, and I, I, I say this totally credibly and sincerely, the party of peace. You know, let's yes. be honest. They're, they're, they're the Clearly. party that's opposed, that, that's opposed to the U.S. global military empire, except when it comes to Taiwan and Mexico. They would very much like <laughs> the U.S. military to get involved in both of those situations. And and in, in like the invading Mexico thing is so insane to me, because like if you think we have a border crisis now, yeah. What the fuck do you think is going to happen when we declare war on the country that we share a border with? Yes. Yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> exactly. No, it is It is wild. Like when Vivek, um, like there was a moment at the debate when he was arguing with, uh, with Nikki Haley about Ukraine. And like when he's arguing about Ukraine, uh, Vivek has moments where he sounds like he could be in code pink. But there are... Like he, I remember he told Nikki Haley, you know, I wish you the best of your luck in your future career on the boards of Lockheed and Raytheon. Uh, but then, uh, yeah, kinda went. he kind of went off <laughs> of that one. Yeah, yeah. Uh, then he, uh, but then he, he also wants to, um, you know, he also wants to invade Mexico, and uh, and he explicitly says, at least until we achieve semiconductor independence, because you know after that, fuck him. But like at least until then. If the exact same scenario that's just played out in Eastern Europe happens in East Asia, we should start World War Three. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's you know, I, I I don't know. I mean, like it's it's I I had uh, <laughs> yeah. Uh, 
Yeah, several. Um, yeah, I don't know. That that's like I, I I've been hearing this stuff for a long time about how the Republicans are all like, like you know have, are like becoming anti-interventionist now, and uh, it's uh, yeah it's kind of hard to uh, it's kind of hard to square that. But uh, what we're talking about her, uh, I don't think anybody's idea of a major presence in the race. But yeah, let's uh, let's do uh, let's do Nikki Haley, uh, former uh, former Congresswoman, Governor of South Carolina, ambassador to the United Nations, and probably the next Republican nominee. I mean, she's she would have been a good nominee in the Republican Party if this were like fifteen years ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Like I, you know, like I, 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 yeah, she's like you know representing that kind of like the the old neoconservative brand, which is you know. Uh, suffered a bit as of lately. I mean, but, you know, like we were saying, we're just talking like Trump appointed John Bolton to be his national security advisor. So, like, I don't want to hear any of this shit about how, like, oh, the new Republican Party. Oh, they're so different than these neocons. Fucking Joe Biden just appointed Elliot Abrams <laughs> to his fucking administration. And he was in the and Elliot Abrams was in the Trump administration, too. So, like, these guys, they never go away and they're never becoming. <laughs> the, no, and I mean, Trump, like the, yeah. Trump assassinated Soleimani, withdrew from the nuclear deal, moved the embassy to Jerusalem, doubled the rate of drone strikes in Yemen. And while we're at it, by the way, sent heavier weaponry to Ukraine than Obama was willing to because he thought it was too escalatory. So like this, this, you know, I mean, it doesn't, but I mean, like, that's kind of the thing. I mean, like, it sort of feels trite to say, but like one of the obvious things about Trump and Trumpism is it doesn't really matter what he does. Like all, all that matters is the, I guess, the vibe. Yeah, um, yeah, we're we're in the vibe times now. Yeah, I so we can just sort of have fun with that. I don't know. I mean, like Haley. I guess like the interesting thing about her is that like she was before before like woke went in the toilet and people like pretended that they were t t doing nothing but talking about that for the last year and a half or whatever. Um, Haley was the one that I think I thought was making like a semi convincing pitch to be like, well, we're not we're not woke in South Carolina, but we're not assholes either because like. She did that thing like where she took down the Confederate flag after yeah. like, uh, that, that horrible shooting was like the, the massacre mm -hmm. of those old black people in the church, the Dylan yep. Roof shooting. Um, and then like, but, you know, that's not going to win her any. <laughs> it's not going to win her any points in this Republican Party. Are you kidding me? She's dead. She's done. Bye bye, honey. Yeah. I mean, it seems like her whole thing is that she's going to be sort of more like unabashedly neoconservative than current vibes permit. And also she's going to say things like oh, we shouldn't be talking about a federal abortion ban because it's, like, unpopular and we don't have the votes for it anyway, which is, like, what are you doing? Like, why Why would you say that on a debate stage in the Republican Party? Well, I mean, probably because you can see the writing on the fucking wall and, like, she's only saying what all their advisors, all the consultants that they hire to, like, yeah. look at, read the polls that they're telling them. Which is like you know they're, now they're now they're having behind the door meet behind you know you know smoke filled room meetings uh, like Mitch McConnell's people and Senate Republicans because they're looking at this next uh, election cycle and they're like we got to stop calling it pro life you know <laughs> which, is already, which is already a term of art you know it's already like you know because I've been I've been shouted before by referring to the anti abortion position as pro life because it's like you know ceding too yeah, much yeah. To, their, to their to their self um, re reporting on how much they love human life. But, you know, I, I, I understand the criticism, but it is what they've been calling themselves. Sure. And now they're just trying to say, oh, we're pro baby or whatever. And it's like, yeah, because that's, 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 that's the problem. It's it was, people was are life about, about yeah. People. Yeah. Look, it's it's not that once you actually start banning abortion, uh, it turns out that like when people actually have to deal with the consequences of that policy, like everybody kind of hates it. And it's uh, and, you know, and it, and like you like crushingly lose elections about it in places like Kansas. Yeah. That's yeah. No, I don't, I don't think the word life was the issue there. Um, well, uh, while we're in, uh, while we're in South Carolina is also uh, Tim Scott. Oh, Tim Scott. Okay. Tim Scott folks, the Washington post is not very nice to Mr. Scott. They've been very cheeky about Mr. Scott and his, and his girlfriend from Canada. I mean, what else is that? Once again, like, I think like 15 years ago, Tim Scott would be, I mean, outside the obvious issue would be a, you know, per, pretty, pretty brilliant uh, choice for the Republican party. Cause you know, he's sort of bland and inoffensive, but you know, reliably right wing, but you know, I mean, it's uh, he's got, he's got to, he's got to show us the girlfriend. Got to show us the girlfriend. Picture yeah, even 15 happen. years ago, he would have had to hire yeah. an actual girlfriend. Um, and, 
you know, uh, I, 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 I won't be too uh, churlish about it, but I'll, I, I will note that, you know, he is running for the nomination of a party that is, you know, stridently uh, homophobic and yeah, right. <laughs> opposed to the rights of gay and trans people. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Fair enough. Um, like, yeah, that is like uh, t- Tim, Tim Scott and all his girlfriends. It's like when the government keeps having hearings about aliens and they're like, they're definitely <laughs> real. And I'm like, just. I need a video or a photo. I don't. I'm not. I want to hear about any well, of this shit about declad. Well, oh, oh, some whistleblower is talking about all the the non-human biologics. Show you got a you got a you got a movie studio in your pocket. Show you got to show me something before I before I get on board with even this obvious bullshit. Yeah, well, the whistleblower who doesn't even claim to have seen the non-human biologics. It's that he right, like right. talked to a guy who told him there were non-human biologics and he believed it. Um, Although, you know, I guess to be fair, they uh, they did show the ET mummies in Mexico. So, <laughs> yeah, well, those were those are really good. Uh, if, if that doesn't convince you, I don't know what will. Yeah, yeah, exactly. OK, um, so uh, I guess uh, there's uh, I guess there is Mike Pence, who uh, who fun trivia fact used to be vice president of the United States. <laughs> I mean, he he's got less of a chance than even the rest of these fucking losers. I mean, like they <laughs> they, they were trying to kill his ass <laughs> not too long ago. These are the people whose votes there he's asking for. Yeah, he's, I mean, he, he's a traitor. He's a he's a traitor and a loser. Get him out of here. He's done. And it's so funny. Like, okay, I understand. I think, like. I understand what like Chris Christie is doing. I think he's running for like a spot on MSNBC or CNN. Yeah, he, he, CNN, thinks, he, right? can, he you know? thinks he can. Like, if he bloody if he bloodies Trump's nose a few times, which he's like not even going to get a chance to do. Yeah, he'll get he'll get a he'll get a carrot instead of a stick. Yeah, right. So I understand what Chris Christie is doing. I I understand what Vivek is doing. I think he's you know running for a, a position in the Trump administration. I even sort of understand what uh, Ron DeSantis thinks he's doing, although I think it's incredibly weird and incompetent because he can't quite decide. It's insane to me that he that he chose to run in 2024. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Like but, it would, he would have been so perfectly set up if he had just waited one more election cycle. But now he's like he has totally exposed himself as like a, a buffoon, incapable of the he's not up to the task, and also alienated himself from the entire Republican Party, which is Trump's party. Yeah, I mean, before that, he'd been doing real good as a uh, as as a Trump sycophant. Uh, like, I don't know why he couldn't have. I mean, I guess the idea is that he wouldn't be able to run with as much prominence because he wouldn't be governor. But no, it was it was a really bad idea. But it's like I do not understand what Mike Pence thinks he's doing. It's baffling. It's baffling. Because I, like, I, I guess it's yeah. just like he's just running. He's like old, and he's just running the algorithm. Where like, hey, if you were. Uh, vice president and you run for president you know like but you know uh, <laughs> vice president of a one-term president is not exactly <laughs> the the stunning yeah. resume but yeah I vice guess- president of a one-term president who's also wildly unpopular among supporters of that guy yeah and who you're also running against him and i the thing i like about the thing that's funny about pence at least in results to like why january 6 and like the fact that like you know he wasn't going to put himself out there to like certify a fake election on behalf of his boss. And the thing is, like, that's no credit to Mike Pence. Like, believe me, like if as I'm sure, you know, and, uh, we are both learned men. We we're both le- learned cultured men. If it had been reasonably close, they all would have fucking stolen that election like course, they did yeah. many times before. But like not only did they have to turn overturn the results of Georgia, but then Michigan and Arizona as well. All the votes have been done counted. They've been done counting. So like in those meetings that were now like coming out Ugh. as part of these these indictments, it was very clear that like Trump Pence was just sort of like he was the motherfucker taking notes on a criminal conspiracy because he was like, I want this all in the minutes because like I know how like I look, he's like he's no dummy. He knows what the power Ugh. of the federal government is. And he knows that like he in, in those minutes, in those meetings, he can't be the guy being like, yeah, I would I would love to enlist my. Yes, please enlist my help in this criminal conspiracy. <laughs> he knew he like. He saw the writing on the wall. He knew that like there was just this this was just too heavy a lift. And like the he did not have anything close to the juice to be able to just declare Trump the winner of that election as vice president because the constitution allows him to do so. <laughs> well, this is the thing, because like every time January 6th comes up, Pence sounds like Chris Christie, but literally the entire rest of the time. Yeah. He, 
he talks about like the accomplishments and achievements of the Trump Pence administration. And uh, he even like, there was that moment in the, you know, the debate where they asked uh, people to raise their hand if they would still, if they would still like if Trump got the nomination and then he went to prison, would they still support him? And like everybody sort of commented on how funny it was that Ron looked to both sides before he raised yes, his hand. Yes, yeah. But like, to me, the craziest thing about that is that Mike Pence raised his hand for that, right? Like, what's the point of Mike Pence? Well, I mean, we, we've talked about this on, on my show as well. And it gets like the fundamental, and this is why there really is no Republican primary, because the fundamental problem that they all face is Ooh. Trump's overwhelming popularity and loyalty of the Republican voters to Donald Trump, the individual, not the Republican Party. But also, like, to be in like to be a Republican or like in the mainstream of the Republican Party today, you basically have to believe that Joe Biden is an illegitimate president and that Donald Trump is the legitimate still elected president of the United States. So to run against him in any kind of presidential election right. or a primary is to betray the U.S. Constitution. Like, it's just how do you say that you believe Trump when he says that, like, the 2020 election was fraudulent and then run against him? The man who was, you know, uh, Ill illegitimately uh, taken from power by a, you know, deep state coup or the vote yeah, he's, he's for the democratic process. Right now, but I don't want to give him another chance. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, I, I mean, mean honestly, like if if I if I think the here's a, here's an interesting thought experiment, like the a yeah, way yeah. for potentially Ron DeSantis or any of these other Republicans to sort of square this impossible circle, is to just be like, yeah, like he is right. The election was fraudulent. It was a coup against him. But like he can't get back in there because he's a loser. Like, you know, he had complained about the deep state forever. But, you know, they, when it came down to it, they cooed his ass real fucking easy. And now he's like showing up to be, you know, have his mugshot taken. He, he's not he's not a, you know, he's not he's not going to lead the revolution. He's already capitulated. Yeah. And when they and when he like sold the mugshot merch, like it, I think it actually says like never surrender on it. It's like, well, literally it's like you just surrender to the yeah, yeah. This is the picture of you that was taken after you surrendered I yourself. Mean, we, we've <laughs> liked imagining what would happen if, if Trump just decided to say, fuck these indictments. Come get me at Mar-a-Lago. <laughs> like, I'm, I'm not showing up for any of this. Like, I have like the Avignon papacy in Mar-a-Lago and then putting the onus on Ron DeSantis to have like Florida <laughs> state troopers be his Praetorian guard to protect him from like process servers or the, FBI would. or the justice department yeah 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 make him follow up on that uh or not because either way either way would be hilarious and either way like trump massively benefits from either making ron DeSantis yeah. do that or making ron DeSantis back down and not do it yeah yeah that's uh yeah no it was, it was pretty weak um i <laughs> i mean it's also it is also like really funny the way that everybody like for the longest time i think maybe they're starting to say it less but it's like people like horse race commentators will say like oh well trump's obviously gonna get it unless his legal trouble like becomes such that he couldn't it's like well what's the scenario here like yeah. that people just like like republican voters just abandon him because of it because i'm pretty sure that ship has sailed and like he seems to get more popular the more indicted he gets, particularly among Republican voters. So, I mean, it's just a question of like, you know, we talked about it before Eugene Debs ran for president from prison. Sure. The question is, like, could you actually be president from prison and how would that work? Yeah, I mean, presumably he would just pardon himself. I guess so. But the Georgia charges aren't federal. Ooh, good call. So okay. I mean, like he could be he could be president from like a Georgia area prison. And then like the Secret Service is like, you know, <laughs> his his Aryan brotherhood or whatever. Like he has to have some sort of or make a make a deal with like, you know, the Mexican mafia or, you know, black gorilla family to keep him protected <laughs> on the inside and still, you know, a head of state. But, that, but you know, uh, or I don't know, like I, I, I feel like probably I, give him it, house arrest in Mar-a-Lago or something. I don't know. I feel like if Oz had gone on for a couple more seasons, yeah. that would have been a plot line they would have done. That like the a uh, big the, guy the, with a little hat. He's got a little hat. His name's Ada BC. Ada BC, folks. He's got a little hat. But it's this guy's Popeye. We love him. We love him. <laughs> I mean, I can literally imagine how they would have done that with the. You know him like sitting down at the table or whatever in the yard with like flanked by secret service agents to to uh to negotiate uh with uh with with Adebisi and Schellinger. Yeah, uh, Riley's putting crushed up glass in his McDonald's <laughs> fish delight, yeah, exactly. Okay, um, 
so we, we we have mentioned him a couple of times, but there's also uh, there's also former New Jersey Governor uh, Chris Christie, uh, who uh, I I think like okay again you could argue about I mean Mike Pence I think is just running for president because he doesn't know what else to do with himself. That's all I could figure out that like he just he doesn't um, want to face the howling void inside his, his, his heart and skull. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> but uh, but Christie, at least, it seems reasonably clear what he is doing, and it seems like a lot of libs have decided to let bygones be bygones with Christie, like um, because he because he does the one thing that they care about, and you know, and and he you know attacks Donald Trump. Yeah, but like not effectively. <laughs> like, <laughs> when's the last like you know he he bodied Mar little Marco. He bodied little Marco, but I don't know if Christie's ever laid a glove on Trump. I mean, Trump dog walks him. <laughs> Trump, Trump, like he's just a, he's a sidekick. That he's just a heel. But like Trump, it, it's just so fun to watch Trump just shit all over him. Like it's it's great. He's just he's just like a sidekick. Like he's just there to be beat up on by Trump. Well, that is also like, like, and he's not he, like he's not laying a glove on him. No, no. Like and that's the thing too that. Like it would be so much more credible. I, I mean, I actually, literally, don't even know who the Republicans are that would be in a good position to do this. Like, you know, who anybody's ever heard of? I mean, be you know, like not like David French or somebody, but like in the, uh, but like Christie is also like the least possible, cre like the least credible possible messenger for. Oh, I have too much integrity to like Donald Trump. You know, I'm I'm a. Uh, like I, I just have this principled objection to Donald Trump because, because uh, he spent like years like hanging around and letting Trump make fat jokes about him and getting his like laundry and McDonald's for him and uh, and being promised that he would be appointed for different things and then like having the football be yanked away at the last possible moment. I mean that lasted literally for a couple of years, a few years. The only conceivable national Republican figure who could like actually son Trump on a debate stage or out alpha him is Arnold Schwarzenegger. And he's prevented from running for president by our stupid constitution. Not Arnold Schwarzenegger now because he's basically yeah, yeah. just become a Democrat. And like he's sure. like, I don't think he can really speak to Republicans anymore. But like the, the Schwarzenegger of like that ran for governor of California and won. Like, you know, like, like that's like that our Arnie would, would put Donald in it. He would, he would, he would, he would do to Donald what Donald does to Chris Christie. Like if you ever watched the movie pumping iron, he would just yes. like, <laughs> use his like ruthless alpha psychology to just absolutely like physically and mentally dominate Donald Trump. <laughs> he would do to Donald Trump what he did to Lou Ferrigno. Yeah. I, I would, I would, uh, even if I knew all the money was going to the two of them, I would, I would pay a lot for a ticket to watch Donald Trump debate pumping iron era, uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger when he's like talking about how a pump is better than a cum and you know, yeah, yeah. All, all of this stuff, like just, just see how that played off against Trump. All right. Uh, we have, uh, wow. Apparently there's somebody named Ryan Binkley, uh, who's, uh, the co-founder and lead pastor of create church, Who's uh, running for president? But uh, but I, I think we're I think we can. <laughs> Ryan Binky, I've literally never heard of this guy. Uh, I, I, I thought I thought I was doing pretty good knowing about Doug Burgum. Yeah. Well. Okay. Uh, yeah. No. I have like this is this is literally I'm looking at this list. This is the first I'm uh, I'm hearing about uh, Ryan Binkley. So I don't I don't think Binkley is uh, I don't think Binkley is. Uh, is I've really never big. heard of him. I have no fucking idea who this guy take, is. Take it off. Uh, Doug Burgum, uh, the I think literally the only thing I know about Doug Burgum is that he somehow made it into the Republican debate and he'd like injured himself before him. <laughs> and he made it into the debate with this like weird donation strategy where if like and barely legal where like if you donated a dollar, you would get twenty dollars back <laughs> or something. So it's like just like paying people to be so he reaches like the small donor threshold to get on the stage. I mean was he like governor of like North Dakota, one of the Dakotas, um, or senator or congressman? He's from the Dakotas. Yeah, North Dakota. He's, he's got like big, thick, like Brezhnev eyebrows, which I respect. <laughs> in a, which I respect in a leader. He sort of looks like a wolf man. Um, yeah, that's that's basically all I know about Doug Burgum. But once again, he's a nobody and he's going nowhere. Yeah, uh, which is funny, by the way. Uh, mentioned Brezhnev because I actually looked this up. 
the other day because you know when people talk about how old all of the most important politicians in the u.s are right now i hear these like late ussr jokes a lot but uh i i just got curious about this the other day and googled it uh brezhnev when he died in office was not quite 76 uh he was uh he was like oh close to <laughs> uh Okay, uh, I I like just earlier today I was on the uh, Talking Simpsons podcast and yeah. we did the uh, the Mr. Plow episode. Yeah, yeah. And if you'll remember, if you'll remember from that episode, uh, there, there's a joke in Homer's public access commercial where like you get a free uh, T-shirt and it says Stockwell for Veep, and he goes he can still surprise you. But it was like the, the Ross Perot's um, uh, VP candidate, uh, uh, which is widely regarded oh, yeah. to be like. Like his his appearance on the debate stage in the vice presidential debate was like ended the Perot campaign and was widely regarded to be like one of the most embarrassing displays because he was like trying to turn on his his hearing aid and he just didn't, didn't seem to know where he was and he was just doddering and it was a disaster for Perot. We were just talking about that on Talking Simpsons. Uh, he he was sixty nine when that <laughs> happened. Sixty nine. Yeah, uh... was like a decade younger than Joe Biden. Yeah, which is also while we're doing the Soviet Union. Uh... And Dropov was a few months short of his 70th birthday uh, when he died in office, and uh, Chernenko was uh, was 74. So that's the uh, so so the oldest of those guys, the uh, the so you know the Soviet leaders who died as like extremely old men in office, the oldest of them uh, was uh, wow. was was a year younger or. Uh, yeah, the oldest of them was uh, was over a year younger than Trump and uh, and four years younger than uh, than Biden. Well, I mean, you know, like I'll, I'll lead the I'll lead the listeners to draw whatever conclusions or parallels they would like from this comparison. But all I'll say is, you know, very, very good sign for the long term viability of any political and economic system when the people in charge of it are literally all decrepit mummies who nobody believes in or trusts at all. <laughs> yeah, Um Fair enough. Uh, all right. Out of the only other name I recognize here at all is uh, is Asa Hutchinson. Oh wow, Asa. Uh, yeah, that's. Trump says I, I call him Ada. I call him Ada Hutchinson. But he won't say why. <laughs> no, no. I'll leave leave that to cruder people. <laughs> yeah. Um, that's. Uh, Apparently, uh, I remember this actually. So at the debate, he was like bringing up the fact that he was the he was like the head of the DEA under uh, under W because like that made him tough, which uh, I think will make precisely nobody look twice at yeah. him uh, in this uh, this cycle. So uh, let's not look twice at him either. I want to. He's, uh, going, for, he's going for all the fans of uh, Hank Schrader from Breaking Bad. Everyone loves Uncle Hank, and he wants <laughs> just a little, a little, a little, a little glint of that uh, DEA shine from his big bald dome. <laughs> yeah, the DEA magic. Uh, fair enough. Well, uh, I do want to switch gears in the uh, the last chunk of the time we have together because we were talking before we started recording. Uh, you said that you had not seen this yet. So in uh, so as we're recording this on Friday, people watch on Monday. Uh, there is a uh, there is a brand new uh, Thomas Friedman uh, column in, uh, in New York Times. Uh, it's uh, I love the headline: A trip to Ukraine clarified the stakes. Period, and they're huge. <laughs> <laughs> I would love it if Thomas Friedman wrote that article, but he was like, a trip to U Ukraine really clarified the stakes for me. They don't matter that much. Who cares? <laughs> that made me realize I don't give a shit about it either. Yeah. <laughs> did, he, did he go with Biden? <laughs> I don't think he went with Biden, but uh, he says, um, uh, when visiting Kiev last week, uh, my first trip to Ukraine since Vladimir Putin's invasion in February 2022, uh, I don't know how often he visited before that. Uh, I tried to get my exercise every morning by walking the grounds of St. Michael's Golden Domed Monastery. Its serenity, though, has been disrupted by a jarring exhibit of destroyed Russian tanks and armored personnel carriers. During my walks, I'd poke my head into these jagged, rocket-pierced hulks, wondering what terrible death must have come to the Russian soldiers operating them. Um, and uh, and I, I just, like, okay, uh he, you know, he spends a lot of time soul searching here about how 
uh, perfect justice would require expelling the Russians from every inch of Ukrainian territory, presumably including Donbass and the Crimea. And, uh, and but like that may uh, that may not be uh, be possible. Uh, and what to do about it. But like the thing that really strikes me about this um, is that he, he says uh, that like, okay, uh, what Putin is doing in Ukraine is my favorite paragraph is not just reckless, not just a war of choice, not just an invasion in a class of its own for overreach. <laughs> yeah. I mean, sure. he, had to, he had to add that a class of its own one, lest anyone forget. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Lest anyone uh, forget about other recent uh, wars of uh, choice and uh, aggression. Mendacity, immorality, and incompetence. All right, so class of its own for overreach, mendacity, immorality, and incompetence, all wrapped up in a farrago of lies. What he is doing is evil. Um uh, he has trumped up any number of shifting justifications and, you know, look, maybe that's just too obvious to be worth belaboring too much, but, um, but um, reckless war of choice, overreach, mendacity, immorality, incompetence uh, justified by lies, shifting justifications. I, I don't know. I mean, I feel like uh, I, I feel like something from like that maybe happened in my early twenties is coming back to me right now. Yeah. I mean, it's amazing, like uh, how crystal clear his analysis of the world is when he's talking about a, an adversary of the United States government. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, you OK. Yeah, sure. Um, this is, you know, so he goes. Uh, um, that's uh, what is so evil beyond the death and pain and trauma and destruction. Uh, he has inflicted on so many Ukrainians is that a time when climate change, famine, health crisis, and more are stressing uh, planet Earth. Uh, the last thing humanity needed was to divert so much attention, collaborative energy, and money and lives to respond to Putin's war. Wait, wait. I'm sorry. What is he talking about? Other than, like, I'm sorry, Ukraine and Russia and the United States that's footing the bill for this shit? Nobody on the rest of the planet is has their attention diverted to the war in Ukraine. And I know that seems like a harsh thing to say. Sure. But it is, like, it is, like, outside of, like, uh, Ukraine and Russia and America, which it's, like, you know, played up, like, very intensely because we're involved in it. Uh, I don't think this has diverted the attention of the world from global warming or any of these other problems that are facing other places in the world who maybe could use an ounce of attention outside of, you know, the, the, an, an, another war Thomas Friedman is promoting. Yes. Uh, yeah, it's also, uh, yeah, exactly. It's like, okay, does Thomas Friedman want people to pay less attention to the war in Ukraine? It kind of doesn't seem like it. Um, he... Um, uh, so he quotes Timothy Snyder because, of course, he does. Uh, this is not a war in which the aggressor has some vision, some outline for the future. Rather, on the contrary, for them, everything you is know, black. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not smart enough, nor have I read uh, Timothy Snyder's works. Like I, I, I'm not smart enough to critique him as a historian. All I will say about Timothy Snyder is that he has replaced George Orwell as like the most cited author by stupid people. So like. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Like, I can't speak to the work of Timothy Schneider. I mean, like, I, a lot of people really respect his work. I've, I haven't read yeah. Bloodland, Bloodlands is like the, the big book. Yeah. I haven't read it. But like everyone I see quoting this guy, I know for sure. I know enough to know that they're fucking stupid. So, yeah, I mean, I think that uh, <laughs> like I, I mean, I think probably in Orwell's case, uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of selective, uh, you know, selective reading there. Uh, there's, uh, I always think of, uh, there's a, um, like the, the sort of most popular edition of, uh, I don't remember it's 19 years. I think it's animal farm has a, uh, in the introduction, there's a quote from, um, there's a quote from Orwell's essay, why I write, where he says that since 1936, every serious line I've written, has been written against totalitarianism and for democratic socialism, and they just like cut off the last three words. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Of the sentence in the introduction, uh, Snyder, I, I suspect, may be getting less of a bad rap. I've only read uh, a little bit of what he's written, but you know, he seems to be like just a. Uh, well, I mean, he's all in on this Ukraine war. He's definitely all in on the Ukraine war. He was definitely all in on like Russia Gate and how you know the most important thing in the world was you know that. Uh, Trump was a fascist and, you know, all that stuff. Uh, 
Before that, I mean, he seems like, you know, maybe he says things that are worth reading on other subjects, but like on contemporary politics, he's in a very like, uh, you know, he's in a pretty, uh, he's in a pretty clear lane. Uh, so Friedman says uh, that you like, So I get back to this idea that Friedman is like, oh, like, it's just, we, we have to divert all this attention from like, I don't know, spending money in this country or fixing global warming because we have to keep arming Ukraine to the tune of like three trillion dollars. Like, oh, we just we have to do that. It's it's diverted our attention. We have no other choice here. And I know like in, in like, look, there are no good choices here. You know, like sure. like yeah. uh, like, uh, you know, like I th this war, like, I mean, it, I it's made full. It's made a biggest enough a fool of me already. Sure. So like I'm not like I, I thought there was no way Russia was going to invade Ukraine because I was like, oh, that seemed catastrophically suicidal and stupid. But, you know, it doesn't stop uh, America. Sure, from yeah, doing, sometimes you know, great powers do things. That yeah, are no stupid yeah, yeah like exactly but I, I don't know i'm like this this offensive currently going on it, it there are still plenty of surprises to come none of them good i imagine but like it does seem no. like even as even friedman is wrestling with everybody kind of understands like what the contours of like ending this war look like and it's like a huge achievement for ukraine that like that they would basically won in my opinion if all they lose is crimea and donbass or like the eastern part of the country which is functionally not really part of ukraine to begin with or i don't know like most of the people uh. there view themselves as russian it's very complicated i i feel like i'm getting too far out of my depth but like i think in the west like the the, the uh. sort of patrons of this horrible ongoing war i think it's very clear what it would take to end it and then they're all just trying to avoid doing that thing which involves some sort of negotiated concession to russia right yeah no, I, I think so. I think that like um, that's obviously it's a horrible, both sort of criminal and self-defeating thing to do. I'm right there with you. I didn't think it was going to happen. Uh, always, you know, <laughs> the uh, the st you know the joke that I would always tell when like Ukraine came up, I, f I feel felt a little bad about when I when the invasion actually started. Uh, which was that, you know, my main comment on the situation in the Ukraine is that if they wanted me to leave off that definite article, they should have been nicer to my family. But <laughs> uh, yeah, good point. Uh, but um, but in any case, like, uh, like, look, I didn't think they would do it. It was a stupid thing to do. Sometimes, you know, sometimes imperial leaders do stupid things. It's a, you know, it's an awful criminal thing that they did. But I guess I know you're not supposed to do this because this is committed the cardinal sin of whataboutism. But I always think about the invasion of Iraq and what I would have what, what I would have wanted any other like rival power to do in yeah. response to the invasion of Iraq. And I don't think like become more and more militarily involved with propping up Iraq until such time as we were on the brink of World War Three is what I would have wanted them to do in response. I think that. Um, I, I think if there had been some way for, I don't know, China or somebody to like broker a diplomatic settlement to either, either hold off the war or stop it midway through, uh, I would have been, you know, I would have been in favor of that. You know, I mean, I'd like, obviously, yeah. Like if China had decided it was in their absolute vital interest to like, uh, like prop up Saddam Hussein against the U S military and did so by like, shipping him carte blanche like the, the the cream of the crop of their defense industry like you know we wouldn't have liked it but i mean like if you have a problem with that then like ask yourself what the fuck are we doing with ukraine now yeah no totally i mean and without even getting into the uh like the stuff from the uh the uh the guy the airman who was like posting posting stuff to impress his friends in the discord server uh, that like Pentagon documents that like uh, that there are, you know, there was like some tiny number and it was in a support role, but there were like special forces boots on the ground in yeah. Ukraine. Uh, and, you know, like the CIA being logistically involved yeah. in operations. It, do, to, like, it does yeah. not bear thinking about too long because I, I, I don't, it goes back to the dead zone. Uh, yeah, yeah, like, exactly. The beginning. Like, I just, I don't want to know about it. I don't, I just try to keep it out of my head. Yeah. Uh, so yes, uh, this, is, for, this is why I choose to live in New York, by the way, because I want to. I want to go out and like, like I want to just turn to dust like that. I don't want to stick around after the, after the first fucking bomb falls. Yeah, I guess we're. Uh, I guess I guess in L.A. we're gonna have some sort of uh, night of the comet scenario. <laughs> Manhattan Miracle Mile. <laughs> 
Fair enough. Uh, yeah, Friedman says this is as obvious a case of right versus wrong, good versus evil, as you'll find in international relations since World War II. And, you know, I don't know. I guess I just always, like, think about there's that, um, you know, Fr when Friedman was on Charlie Rose, uh, I think. This. Suck yeah. on this. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. It's like, come on. I mean, back to like, you know, he 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 sees good and evil when it's when it's Russia and what they're doing to Ukraine. And you know, fair enough. They invaded sure. another country. There are lots of people are being killed. It's awful. But like the the contrast that to the utter glibness with which he discussed the US military killing, I don't know, about a million people in Iraq. All right. Uh we still have um there are a couple of minutes uh, on this one that uh, that we are going to uh, to be missing just for the sake of time. We'll certainly post the whole thing for uh, the whole thing for patrons. But uh, Robert is here for uh, the post game, so uh, we are going to go to that in just a moment. Uh, before that, um, I I think that uh, there's really uh, you know. Yeah, and I should say, if you are a patron, you should already have the email for the with the post game link. If you're not a patron, there's no time like the present. Patreon.com slash Ben Burgess. Get those exclusive post games on Monday and Thursday nights. Access to the Discord. Um, you know, exclusive things like the full version of the Medicare interview with those last few minutes. Uh, ex you know, uh, exclusive access uh, in, uh, in some cases, etc. Mostly our undying love and gratitude. For helping to keep this going but for now before we go to the post game with robert i think there's really only one way to to play us out uh for the end of the main show now that the war is over and there's some difficulty with the peace was it worth doing well i think it was unquestionably um uh worth doing charlie um and i i think that <clears throat> looking back I now certainly feel I understand more what the war was about. Um, and it's interesting to talk about it here um, in Silicon Valley, because um, I think looking back at the 1990s, uh, I can identify that there are actually three bubbles of the 1990s. There was the NASDAQ bubble. There was the corporate governance bubble. And um, lastly, there was what I would call the terrorism bubble. And the first two were based on creative accounting. The last was based on moral creative accounting. The terrorism bubble that basically built up over the 1990s said, flying airplanes into the World Trade Center, that's OK. Wrapping yourself with dynamite and blowing up Israelis in a pizza parlor, that's OK. Because we're weak and they're strong and the weak have a different morality. Having your preachers say that's OK, that's OK. Having your charities raise money for people who do these kinds of things, that's okay. And having your press call people who do these kind of things martyrs, that's okay. And that built up as a bubble, Charlie. And 9-11 to me was the, the, the peak of that bubble. And what we learned on 9-11 in a gut way was that that bubble was a fundamental threat to our open society. Because there is no wall high enough, no INS agent smart enough, no metal detector efficient enough to protect an open society from people motivated by that bubble. And what we needed to do was go over to that part of the world, I'm afraid, and burst that bubble. We needed to go over there, basically, um, and um, uh, take out a very big stick um, right in the heart of, of that world. And, um, and burst that bubble. And there was only one way to do it. Because part of that bubble said, we've got you. This bubble is actually going to level the balance of power between us and you because we don't care about life. We're ready to sacrifice. And all you care about are your stock options and your hummers. And what they needed to see was American boys and girls going house to house from Basra to Baghdad um, and basically saying, which part of this sentence don't you understand? You don't think you know, we care uh, about our open society? You think this bubble fantasy, we're just going to let it grow? Well, suck on this.